Hi, Terry. Hello, Ed, are you able to unmute? If I did it. Oh, okay. thank you. <clears throat> okay, you're ready. You're good to go. Good afternoon. I'm Stanley Green, Chair of the Historic Preservation Commission of the City of College Place, and I'm calling to order the 26th meeting of the City's Historic Preservation Commission. We'll start with the roll call. Um, Gary Peterson has an excused absence. Mike Denny. Present. Harold Gottschall. Edward Kantz. Terry's Present. on mute. Okay, great. All right. There. All right. So um, the next part of the agenda, um, each commissioner has the option to remove an item from the consent agenda if they wish to have it considered separately. Because I wish to have the minutes approval considered separately, what we will do next is simply approve the agenda for today's meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented for today's meeting? So move. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right. So um, I would like to request a modification to the draft minutes from the December 17 meeting under item four, where the draft minutes say Commissioner Stanley Green suggests that everyone review and provide feedback by the next meeting as the chapters, especially chapters eight and nine may have upsetting content issues impacting College Place. I ask to change that to Commissioner Stanley Green suggests that everyone review the available draft chapters before the next meeting and pre be prepared to provide feedback at the next meeting as chapters eight and nine may have content which may be controversial in College Place. Um, does anyone have an objection to that modification of the draft? Okay. Um, if not, I would accept um, a motion to approve the minutes as Modified. So move. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so the minutes from the December 17 meeting are approved. Do we have any requests for public comment? The clerk's office received none. All right. Okay, so the next item is election of officers for 2021. And with, is this something that we could postpone to next month with two commissioners absent? I would be more comfortable um, handling this at the next meeting. There's only one absent, Gary. Oh. You okay. have four commissioners here today. Oh, okay. Um, right, sorry about that. I, the monitor isn't showing me. Um, so, I, I, I personally would, I, I don't know, is there a way that we, with, with, with Terry being absent, is there a way that- I'm here. Oh, okay, Terry. Okay, I'm Gary. sorry, I can't Gary see Gary Peterson. People. Yeah, Gary is absent. I apologize, but the only person I can see is John. I don't <laughs> know why that happened to the feed. Um, Go so, up into the upper right-hand corner and hit your view. Okay. To go go gallery side by side. Okay, I have it in side by side. Okay, there we go. That 
that takes care of that problem. Thanks. Because when we started out, I could see everybody. I'm, I'm a visually oriented person, so it's, it's disorienting when I can't see everybody. Um, okay, so I guess my procedural question is, is there a way that we could have a discussion of this amongst um, how, what is the means by which we could have a discussion of this or at least send a memo out to all the commissioners, including Vice Chair Gary Peterson, who's not here today, saying this is an item coming up for the next meeting and would you be willing to serve in a position? I'm a little uncomfortable with voting for officers, especially when one of the incumbents isn't present and may or may not wish to continue in that position. So um, any discussion would need to be held in a meeting like such. You do have a quorum of members. And so it is preferred that you do. Um, John, what is your take on this? Well, you did approve the agenda for the election of officers, but um, I don't think that there's, if you, if, if you guys, if somebody wants to make a motion to, to vote on, postpone this to the next meeting, I, I don't think it really matters. Um, and I don't, there's also just to clarify, there's not anything in, in the bylaws or anything that prohibits the existing chair from, uh, you know, continuing in his position or the vice chair for that matter either, so. Okay, so um, under the issue of electing officers, and, and it's my understanding, for example, it would not be a violation for me to individually, for example, speak with one commissioner about what his preference is, is that correct? It would not be. Okay, so that would be a legitimate thing to do. That, that would be something I could do with, without being in violation of any regulations. Um, I, so I'm, what I would prefer to do, and I'd like to hear if the other commissioners agree with this, is that I would like to talk with privately with Commissioner Peterson, Vice Chair Peterson, prior to the next meeting, about whether he wishes to continue in that role or a different role and bring this up again at the next meeting. Um, does, do any other commissioners have thoughts on that? Go for it. I have no objection. No objection. Okay, I'll, I'll accept a motion to postpone election of officers to next meeting. I move. Postpone. Okay, um, is there a second? Second. Okay. All Harry, in favor was that you? Aye. Pardon me? Yes. Okay. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I'll talk to Vice Chair Peterson prior to the next meeting. Um, okay. So the next item is the 75th anniversary book. And so, um, I, I would like to know, um, so I've reviewed all that, I personally have reviewed all the chapters that we received in December. I have not had time to go into any detail with the chapters we received yesterday, um, but I'd like to open the floor for discussion. Um, first of all, uh, Mike, since you're writing it, I was wondering if you'd like to talk about the process and where you feel we stand in the process now? Well, we have um, right at about 25,000 words. And uh, all the chapters have been completed along with what I call side boxes, which is uh, what Kiyoki Press frequently does in books they have. So a side box would be um, have a separate story than what the chat uh, on that page. And it's just an, a way of it adding additional material to that chapter area. And um, 
it's usually connected to what the chapter's about, but different. You just don't want to have a chapter with 40 pages on a chapter, 50 pages on a chapter. So, and they typically have no more than um, oh, 500 words on a page, or 600 words. So we have chapters now that are in excess of 3,000 words. And so that's quite a few pages uh, or more. Uh, usually their average chapter runs 18 to 20 pages with photos. So um, I, uh, they'll, when they do their editing, we'll find out how many pages they're actually looking at. So, but, um, so from my past experience with them, they, they do these nice little side boxes, usually under a page with photographs. And then you can read the side box and look at the photos. So. Okay. What was the, uh, what was the intended contractual length? 33,000 words. So you've got, you've got about 25,000. Okay. Yes. A little over. So with uh, text under photos and the side boxes, I think we pretty much will be right at around 28, 29,000 words. Okay, um, do commissioners have any other um, comments or questions? Okay. Um, a, a question that I have, Mike, is I noticed that sometimes um, a historical event appears in more than one chapter. So exa for example, the formation of the Presbyterian congregation and construction of their churches, I believe I saw that in more than one chapter. It is. It's in two separate chapters, and that's because the line of interest is different in both those chapters. So the one is the historic religions of College Place, and they are very much a part of that. And the other was as they pertained to um, that era that they are they arrived. And okay, so, so one of the chapters is in a subject matter mode, and the other chapter is part of a chronological sequence. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, are there other questions? Um, Okay, at the last meeting, I, um, I mentioned that there might be concern about references to uh, federal policies pertaining to the present pandemic. And I, um, I'm not speaking as chair now, at, but as a commissioner, my, my own view is that I believe that it would be more appropriate for the book to focus on what the impact is on this community of the pandemic and not discuss federal or state policies in any detail other than to say that say for example there was a state order about schools or a state order about restaurants and this is the impact so impacts that examples of impacts on the community could include what has happened to the various educational institutions as to whether or not they're having virtual class or in person or some hybrid. The fact that the school district um, installed portable classrooms because of spacing requirements, um, impact on businesses such as, um, and, and I can think of photos that might illustrate some of this. For example, a photo of the sign at Andy's Market saying senior citizens only from seven to 8 a.m or 
changes in how Walmart um, offers shop the shopping experience, such as ordering in advance with um, curbside service, as well as some of the other businesses or um, the Happy Wanderer. Um, I'm guessing they may have gotten a grant for this. Um, I, I don't know precisely what the city or other governmental entities have done, but some of you may have noticed they built a patio to have more outdoor seating. Um, there have been changes to Valley Transit service. Um, there are signs reflecting the fact that the Walla Walla U campus is closed except to um, current students, faculty and staff. And there are protocols even for them to be able to move around the campus. Um, the city and other entities have hosted drive-by parades. Some of you may have participated in or witnessed drive-by parties to celebrate somebody's birthday or retirement. So these are all direct ways in which life in our community has changed. And I, what I'm saying is I, my personal view is that a discussion of how life in our community has changed, I think is appropriate, whereas discussion of this federal approach to the issue and the state approach other than the specific orders that affect us is A, not appropriate and B is to put it mildly politically very, very controversial. And this book is to serve all the members of our community. And I'm saying this not because I agree or disagree with a particular viewpoint, but because this book is being funded by sources that are paid for by people from a range of perspectives. And I think that taking a perspective that some people may vigorously disagree with may not be appropriate in this forum. And I'm interested in um, any responses each of you may have. Well, I can certainly explain why I did that. But um, so what I've noticed is that as things have unfolded in DC, there has been a real impact on people's perspectives here. Um, I've noticed that a fair number of folks uh, believed uh, a lot of what was coming out of the White House um, I've come across to quite a few people who will not wear masks because there is no virus. I've come across people that are not going to be told what to do because it's not for real. Um, and so I see that as a real impact and uh, why we continue to have uh, infection rates. I also see a lot of what they have, a lot of folks uh, accepted as reality, as um, anything but reality. And that has had an impact on this uh, community. But I do take uh, what you say, uh, Stanley, um, as um, fair, fair judgment. So um, I will say that, um, I think we're going to be impacted for some time because of those that have accepted these ideas that were less than accurate. And so uh, it, that really concerns me because they don't believe um, the reality of the vote. They don't believe in a lot of things. And uh, I just find that disturbing because I think we're going to be dealing with that for some time. And as history proceeds, and I see it as a historical thing in this community, as history proceeds, I think we're still going to be dealing with it, even though it's not based on fact or reality. And so, um, and that's not my opinion. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an opinion of quite a few people, but um, I just, I, I have great concern 
over what we're going to be dealing with as a community with folks that have been so, um, you know, have, have such ideas. Uh, and I see that as historic fact. Uh, it's not an, merely an opinion. Uh, so I don't know how, how you would you deal with that? Um, I'd like to ask the other commissioners, Ed, do you have any observations on this question of what about the pandemic should or should not be included in a book of this nature? Well, I think just saying that there was um, <clears throat> mandates by state government and there was, there was uh, considerable sickness, um, saying things that are um, basically like factual instead of opinion. But those are certainly, uh, I mean, just like in other parts, they talk, talk about um, things that, that happened in those times that affected the community. Um, it's, it's no different. But I think you can kind of say what happened without giving your opinion as to uh, whether you think the vote was legitimate or not, or those, those kind of things. You don't have to get into those kind of areas. Okay. Harry, do you have observations on what you think would be appropriate to include or not include on this subject in a book of this nature? Well, actually, I, I'm, uh, I'm kind of torn. Uh, on one hand, I think that, Stan, the points that you mentioned, which were the specific elements of impact on the community, uh, would be appropriate to add the comment that I made in my written notes was just that to link to link the pandemic more directly uh, to community circumstances. On the other hand, uh, I firmly, firmly align myself on Mike's side in terms of uh, implications and impressions. Uh, uh, but I also think that maybe they might be a bit too strong, given the circumstances, given the fact that this does need to. Uh, reflect a reading audience that would probably, I suspect, that there are many in town who would object uh, to some of those elements in that particular chapter. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think Mike makes some very good points about the fact that, uh, that this particular issue was controversial uh, and it does affect the community adversely when there are people who rigorously deny the existence of, of the virus, see it only as a partisan ideological hoax. Uh, that's certainly, I think, worthy, worthy of reference because it, it does happen. It is fact. Uh, however might you might perceive it, it is fact. So uh, that, that uh, you know, we, we can certainly work out a revision though of that chapter. It shouldn't be too difficult. I agree. Stanley, uh, would it be all right if I said something? Yes, please. So I, I've reviewed those two chapters and I, um, and I, I would tend to agree with what, what Stanley is saying and, and Terry and, and Ed as well. I, while I don't disagree with the political undertones that, that are in those two chapters, um, I, uh, I think they could be toned down a bit um, and just and keep it more factual um, to how our community would, and, and it's easy to present that on both sides. I mean, the fact that, you know, mask wearing to begin with, we were told, you know, wouldn't do anything. And then, uh, you know, a month or two later, we were told that it would. And, uh, and, and people that didn't want to believe in the virus said that that was just a hoax. And so, you know, it was used from both sides. And so there's ways to, to you know, factualize the situation that we're all in, and, um, but take some of the political undertones out of it. Um, and, and the same thing when, we, when, we, when we're talking about, um, you know, the politics of it. Um, so uh, Mike and the mayor have also reviewed those two chapters and they are concerned and would like to see some revisions to those, so. They'd like to see what? Some revisions. 
Oh, okay. Okay, I thank you each, and, and if you have more to say, I appreciate that. Based on each of your comments, my suggestion is perhaps stating, you know, that that some people were confused by the directions as as the you know as the government and the community and scientists felt their way through the early stages you know specifically the issue of you know the the scientists and the government initially said mask wearing wouldn't help and then they said it would and how that could you know that did cause confusion and that as a result of a number of factors, there were differing perspectives and there were people who felt that the virus wasn't real or that in the long term felt that mask wearing was not appropriate. There were others who believed that it was. And, <clears throat> and so I think documenting that there was controversy and that the, that effect and the controversy affected this community, I think a brief statement about that is entirely appropriate as a historical fact, there is controversy. Um, and I think, so un, un, unlike the 1918 and 1919 pandemic in that era, partly because of the war going on, a lot of information was suppressed from the media. So doing research about that, I've seen in documentaries and read there was a lot of information about what actually went on that wasn't easy to come by. And, and I'm guessing, Mike, that in your research, you didn't see a whole lot of information about that pandemic and its impact in College Place. Is that correct? Not in College Place, but in Walla Walla County. Okay. And the public health department in Walla Walla County was the lead agency in how they were going to deal with it, not the state. Okay. And they put the mandate out there. There was mask wearing required. Okay. Um, and if you refused to, you were fined or arrested. There was no qualms about it. Okay. And so when I read that, I thought, boy, they'd have a absolute rebellion on their hands today if they set out to do that. Um. Hundreds and hundreds of people died in this county in 1918-1919. And the, that pandemic faded the summer of 1919 is when it right. went out. But when they had the 1919 tractor show here hmm. in April of 1919, they had 60, 40 to 60,000 people show up here to look at this power farming equipment show and the pandemic was not over. Wow. <laughs> and I've often wondered, I found nothing about the potential of additional infections because of that uh, huge gathering of people here. Super spreader event. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Well, well but, in my own family, my grandparents, my grandfather was a student at Walla Walla College at that during that time, 1918-19. And he and my grandmother lived across College Avenue. Um, some of you might remember Connard Pond. Anyhow, that was- Oh, yes. Yeah. So that outlined the basement of the house where they lived. Okay. And anyhow- so my grandmother was due to give birth in January of 1919, and the family doctor told her to not go across the street to the sanitarium to give birth, but to stay home to give birth because the pandemic, that there were so many influenza patients in the sanitarium. Yeah. So um, that's a way in which it affected my own family. So I, I'm going to make a suggestion here, Mike. You can consider it, but I would suggest... Um, and, and I apologize that I, uh, you may have already said this and I did read the chapter, but I, I'm not, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not remembering every part of it. So you may have already done this and pardon me if you have, but you know, what you said a couple of minutes ago about how the County Health Department in 1918 and 19 was in charge, not the state. There were mask mandates and fines. Um, I know from what I've read elsewhere that 
mask wearing was even controversial then. It was. Um, and, and then, so maybe talk about that when you're in that chronological period, when you're dealing with the late 1910s, but maybe when you get to the present pandemic, just make a reference as noted, you know, in comparison, there are parallels to what happened, you know, in 1918, 19, with regard to some of these issues. And, and to the extent that you have statistics of how many people have died, I don't know how readily available the statistics are of the deaths in Walla Walla County in 1918 and 19. Um, I believe the statistics of, you could say as of this writing, you know, X number of people in Walla Walla County have died from this pandemic. Right. So the, the 1918 pandemic, they actually do not have firm numbers on that. Wow. Uh, yeah, because people were coming and going through the area to come for medical treatment and not surviving on their way home, or they would die before they got here, but in the county. So um, Walla Walla was the center of medical assistance and the only hospital, uh, St. Mary's, and then the sanitarium. And uh, the poor farm actually suffered a fair number of fatalities uh, at their sanitarium. So it was, um, it was really something and it really clobbered this uh, community. And so when I, when I compare that pandemic to this pandemic, there's some similarities, but there's also some huge differences. And that is we have much better understanding of uh, viral pathogens, and they didn't have that. They were still stumbling around in the dark trying to figure out what on earth, how to deal with this. And so I, I, I look at what we have today, and we've just been so overwhelmed uh, as a country and as a state with infected, infected people. And back then, the people came in and died. That was the bottom line. Um, 30% died. That's a lot of people. <laughs> so 30% um, of those infected? Correct. In, in this county wow. that they're aware of. Yeah. And in those days, there were probably a, a higher percentage of people who did not seek medical help. They were more likely correct. to stay at home and do in-home treatments and or die at home. Right. And a lot of children died mm -hmm. in 1918. In fact, a large preponderance of the mortality were uh, people from 20 under that passed. Right, so and that's that a was, contrast to this pandemic where it seems that the impact on children is somewhat less severe. Correct, and, and that pandemic was a flu. It was not a uh, coronavirus, a whole different uh, animal. Right. So uh, that's, that made a big difference. Right. So it was much more contagious than this pandemic has proven to be. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so anyway, I guess I could go in and compare and contrast. I've done that to a point, but I could certainly redo that and make it very clear that here's what it was like in 1918, 19, and here's what we are facing today and what we've dealt with. I, I would appreciate that. How do the other commissioners feel? Sounds, sounds reasonable. Just kind I think of it's good grounds for comparison then and now would make an excellent part of the book. Yep. Okay, I agree. Great. Uh, now, do we have somebody who can take photographs of what's going on now? Um, you know, I, I gave a few suggestions, signs. Oh, yeah. and... I, I can go take photos. Okay. I have Are the you... perfect camera for it. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah. Does anyone else want to discuss this issue or anything else about where we are on the book now? Um, so could we um, now do you think that, um, and I'm looking forward to these revisions, I think it sounds like a, a really engaging way to approach this. Would having those revisions available by our February meeting be a realistic goal, Mike? Sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So okay. just one other comment. 
um, in looking at how Walla Walla County has dealt with this, and this includes the citizens of College Place, um, I've been talking to several physicians, some nurses, public health people. It has been a complete catastrophe. And by a catastrophe, I mean there are three or four different agencies trying to run the program, and they're not exactly meshing in their direction. And it has made it extremely difficult for public health, our local public health, to get things done. And it's reached a point of real frustration with the health people in this county having to deal with state people, with uh, some federal people, with uh, some staff from St. Mary's. And it's just been this ongoing, um, as the paper said, a clunky situation. Well, I think, I think quoting the Union Bulletin as opposed to the author of this book expressing an opinion, you know, might be appropriate. Also, yeah. I would suggest including a reference to the first max, excuse me, the first mass vaccination, which happened earlier this week at the Walla Walla U Church. Right. Um, and, and, and as some of you know, that's been somewhat controversial. But it has been. So I talked to several medical folks in the Valley that are here in College Place, and they weren't even notified, and yet they're well over 60 years old, 65, and they weren't even notified of it, <laughs> and they should have been there. On, on the other hand, it's I amazing. I would have liked to have known. Yeah, I would yeah. have too. On the other hand, it's amazing how much they were able to get done on such short notice. Now they you had know, 200 they people show up plus. So, so um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of material, um, but it's a big story. It is, it is. I, I, in my mind, Stanley, I've looked at it and divided it up into four sections. One is the reality of the medical situation. Number two is the reality of the virus uh, and how what its behavior has been in this community. Uh, we've had a lot of infected people here in College Place. Uh, number three is the response and perception of our citizens. And number four is the light at the end of the tunnel, what we're looking at now with the vaccine potential. So that's how I've looked at it. Yeah, those are, I think that's, that's a good breakout of really the major components of it. Yeah, that's yeah. excellent. So, okay, well, um, I want to thank each of you for a good discussion on this. It's a sensitive issue. And, and I, um, I don't, you know, I don't think any of us want to come across as saying that somebody else is wrong about what they're doing, just we want to work together to find a way to present this in the most effective means possible. So thank you. Um, okay, any further discussion about the book and uh, um, from any commissioner? Okay, let's move on to um, item four. Stanley, four. pardon me, can I just for a moment interrupt? Sure. I have a question either for Mike or for Carolyn. Um, I've got a couple of pages of, of marginal notes on my reading of the chapters. Uh, Carolyn, can I just send those on to Mike, or do I have to make those part of a public record? I believe you can send those to him. Okay, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll do that. Just when it constitutes a quorum, when many people are involved, is when it has to be, um, it's, it considers it an open public meeting. Okay. okay. So if it's just and, you and giving your input to him. Yes. That's, that's one thing. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank and you, I Terry. Have, and I have some, I, I went through, and as I was reading through the chapters, I wrote some notes, you know, page number such and such, this, this, this. So I'll send those to you as well, Mike. 
Okay, so do keep in mind that they have an editorial staff at Kiyoki that will go through it line by line as well. So okay, great. Okay. Okay, all right. So um, the next item is certified local government grants. Um, John, are you presenting on that? Yeah. Um, so every year they open up for their grant cycle. Um, so this is how we're funding the, the GPR. It's how we funded the, the study we did uh, the year before on uh, the historic buildings that we have in the community. Um, Carolyn, if you wouldn't mind clicking on that link to open up the web page. Um, <clears throat> we have a little bit of time before we need to make an application. So I thought it would be helpful to provide the commission with uh, the link to past projects that have been funded. So you can see in 2018 uh, or 2019, where we're, where, where's our, um, where are we? We should be listed somewhere on there. Our historic inventory project. It's 2019. 2019. 2019, there it is. Second one. So this is just an idea. Of, you know, I, I, I want this to be a collaboration amongst the commissioners. Uh, um, you know, in the past, uh, you know, it's been the city staff that's kind of come up with the ideas for, you know, what we should apply for grants. Um, and you guys have been doing this for a while. So I'd like, I'd like, to engage with the commission on ideas. Um, so please take some time to, to look through what other communities have done and, uh, and uh, with the idea that it might spark um, some ideas for what we could do here in College Place. Is this something, is there time for us to um, review this between now and the next meeting and discuss it in the next, at the next meeting after we've reviewed this more? Yes. Okay. Yep. Will you be able to email this material to us? It's available on board docs on this meeting under okay. the agenda item. You just click this link and it'll take you right to it. Okay, great. Thank you. So that's all I have on it. Unless you guys wanted, if you already had some ideas, I mean, we could talk about those as well. But I had one idea, John in looking at stuff. And that would be to put some plaques, some information plaques on like um, the building that is the um, Mexican restaurant across from Andy's. That's the old Totem Out Market <laughs> grocery. It would be interesting to put a plaque there on that building about the historic significance of that building and the Totem Out grocery that was there. That was the only grocery in College Place. And, and, the, the, and the robbery. And the big robbery, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wide. yeah. I had a great visit with Tim Blair about that. And he that was just amazingly interesting. And I think a lot of people would be very interested in that. So I was thinking about that. Maybe the three or four oldest homes in College Place put a plaque on that and just tell who you know, who lived there, who built it, what year it was built, kind of like 2020 did in Walla Walla. Sure. So what you just suggested, Mike, I guess my, I think it's a good idea with regard to the homes. I guess, would it be possible to get a grant? If the homeowners agree to it, would it be possible to get a grant that would pay the fee for 2020 to do that? For 2020? Yeah, in other words, 2020, as you know, researches the history of homes and produces those plaques. Correct. But yeah, they definitely. charge a fee to do it. Yeah. So, so my question is, could we get a grant and, and then invite homeowners to, you know, if they agree to this, the grant would pay that fee for that to be done for their home? Yeah. I don't see, if Dan's willing to do that. Well, I... I'm sure that 2020 would be happy to do it if, you know, the, if somebody comes up with a fee that I believe yeah. they're still doing that. And I don't, I don't see why we should start an entirely new program of home plaque since there's an established recognized program. Right. 
Well, I was just thinking of some of our older business buildings. Um, right. the one on the corner of Fourth in uh, College Avenue, that old warehouse there. Right. That's a historic building for College Place. <laughs> so, so um, I guess what I'm thinking is, would one of us be willing to talk with Walla Walla 2020? Um, if no one else is, I would. And about if we can get grants for homes or businesses to get historic signs, could we contract with Walla Walla 2020 to do the research and produce the signs since they already do that thing? Yeah, that would work. I was um, just you know, most people in their day-to-day -day life go by those buildings and have no clue what it is they're walking by. Right, right. How do other commissioners feel about plaques on historic commercial buildings and homes and exploring coordinating with Walla Walla 2020 for the research and sign production. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Does it require a motion? Well, I, I, I guess. Don't think it has, but... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure we do, but it, that would be an idea that we could um, develop further at our next meeting. Um, so unless someone else wants to do it, I'm willing to talk to Walla Walla 2020 um, about whether they would be interested in that kind of a collaboration. My guess is they likely would. So here's what I would suggest, if I could interrupt okay. Stanley. Sure. Um, I, I think that would be fantastic if you reached out to Walla Walla 2020 and found out what the process was. They may have some requirements um, for, you know, 2020 actually, you know, creating a plaque for a home. They and also DAP may also have some requirements. For instance, um, the it's possible in order to qualify for funding that they may need to the 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 building may need to be on a registry. Um, so you know we've done we've done we have a historic um, properties list. And, you know we've done research. So that maybe that would be the first step is we take those properties that we've already done research on and try to get them on a registry, our city registry of historic properties. And then we could, uh, the grant could pay for a plaque and perhaps 2020 is involved in the process of that. Um, but the other thing that I would recommend um, is it would be wonderful if one of, one of you, one of, one of the commissioners would actually um, talk with Kim Gant at DAP um, about uh, projects that could be funded um, rather than staff doing that. Um, if that's, if you're willing to take that on and I can get you Kim's uh, contact information. She's super great lady to, to talk to talk with and work with. So um, would one of you commissioners um, be interested in having that conversation with um, the state's office? I know Mike's really busy with the book. Um, Terry, is that a conversation you'd be willing to have? Sure, I'll be glad to do it. Okay, great. Um, so, so what I would suggest is, you know, you talk about what could be funded and whether what we're proposing of getting a fund where we might invite property owners to um, agree to do this and collaborate if possible with Walla Walla 2020, see if all of that might fit in with the funding requirements. As a CLG product grant. Right, right. Yeah, that'd be great if you could do that and John can put you in touch with them. I appreciate that. Sure. An, an idea that I had that would kind of be a stepping stone from our previous project um, would be to create um, maybe some kiosks around town that um, identified the properties that we've done research on um, because we have that storyboard that went along with it. So maybe there would be a, a sign, um, you know, within pro the proximity of, within the right of way of where one of these properties is that we did research on 
and maybe there would be a QR code or something you would scan with your phone and it would pull up that storyboard for that particular um, property and the history on it. And that might be kind of fun to have a, that could be a walking tour. So maybe we could get funding to get put up signage for that walking tour um, with the storyboard associated with it. That would be cool. Yeah, it really would. absolutely. I've seen signs somewhat like that in neighborhoods in Los Angeles where there's a sign saying, these are historic structures in this neighborhood that tell this story about what happened to this neighborhood and why it was significant in the development of the city. And, and I, I, what you just said, John, I think that if these signs, say for homes particularly, are funded by this grant, perhaps having them placed on the public right of way somehow is a good idea because typically Walla Walla 2020 is the, the homeowners have placed them right next to the front door and people may not necessarily want people coming up to their front porch to squint at the sign. So having, having the signage somehow placed on the public right of way might make more sense. Yeah, I think this would be different than the plaque scenario, um, which really doesn't give a lot of information other than maybe who built the house and the year it was built. Um, what, what I would be envisioning, it would be, it would look more like, you know, a street sign, like a bus stop sign or something, probably not as tall. <laughs> And it might have the city logo on it or something or something that, you know, something about the Historic Preservation Commission. And then just a little, you know, uh, street reflective street sign that, that has, you know, some information, you know, scan this QR code to to learn more about this property or something like that. Right. And I, I, I see that as possibly being in. I, I, we can talk about it further, but I could envision a way to integrate that in with what Walla Walla 2020 does. Um, yeah. So I yeah, don't and we wouldn't have to get property owner information permission to do that either. Right, right. So I think there might be a way of integrating these concepts that we can explore further once we get better ideas of what the parameters are, of what the requirements are regarding the grants. Okay, any more discussion on this for now? We're getting low on time. So I'd like to um, ask each of you to review um, the attachments of you know, what other communities have done. And, and then um, those of us who have homework assignments of things to write or people to talk to before the next meeting, then we'll bring that to our February meeting. And any more discussion on this item? Okay, any more, any reports, John? Uh, no, okay. uh, well, I guess a brief update on the GPR. Uh, we finally got contracts signed um, with Western Washington University. Uh, I don't have a specific start date of when they're gonna be down here, or when we'll have our first public meeting. Um, okay. And I'm still trying to, to negotiate a contract um, to get the, the actually the boundaries of the cemetery surveyed, um, which would be separate. But I want I want to have the boundaries established before we do the GPR of the site, so that we <laughs> we know if we have an, an issue on our hands. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, as that project develops, I could envision that as being another project for collaboration with Walla Walla 2020, which has done a lot of work on historic cemeteries, including that cemetery and producing the sign that's there. And once we get this additional information, Walla Walla, we may want to work with Walla Walla 2020 with regard to maybe updating signage or doing other things to integrate the information that we will gather. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in collaborating with community organizations. Mm -hmm. So, okay, anything else? Okay, our next meeting is scheduled for February 18, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Adjourn.
Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Yep. <laughs> we'll see ya. Mike? Yes. Is, is uh, your email is uh, walla 2 birder at outlook.com? Walla 2 dot. Walla 2 dot birder. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll send you I'll send you my my notes. Okay.